All right. Welcome, everyone, to The Social Kick. I'm Dr. John Mullen, and I'm excited that we have uh, a great show here today. But first thing, we are missing one person. Unfortunately, Brian, Mountain Brian Lundquist, is in California, which all of us are except for our special guest. And we are having some wildfires here, and he was forced to evacuate his place today. So we wish Brian um, to be safe, like everyone out there, be safe, whether you're in California or, or against COVID, um, be safe and, and be healthy, everyone. So he will not be with us today, but I am joined today by Luke, the historian, Justin, and our special <laughs> guest. And let me give you some info about her because she, <laughs> wrong way, there we go. So she was the first woman over 40 to break five minutes in the 500. She has over 200 world records, over 300 masters national records. And I hope I can say her name right. Cause I say everyone's name wrong, but it's close to my wife's name. And my wife's name is Carleen and her name is Carlin. Pikes. All right. All right. Carlin, how are you doing today? Aloha. Doing great. Thanks for being here. You know, I kind of feel like this is like Brady Bunch where I'm going to look up and see Peter. <laughs> Oh and Lord! Look over and this <laughs> is a story Marcia. about Luke. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks again for for joining us here today. Um, we're really excited to talk with you. And one thing we were talking about before the show was how you broke a world record. Wow! And I think how how you said it, you were battling an alcohol addiction, and actually celebrated by having some. Uh, drinks and and partying afterwards. So why don't we dive right into it? And could you tell us a little bit more about that whole experience. Oh, wow. But we, but John, we've skipped a whole bunch of stuff that gets there. So that world record <laughs> we're talking about is age 25, uh, right when I was in the middle of my drinking career. Um, but let's fast forward to 10 years previous to that one at the age of 15, I um, won junior nationals in the 400 yard I am. And it was pretty cool because I was coached by Mike Troy, who had a gold medal from the two gold medals from the 1960 Olympics. And, uh, you know, he always said, Carlin, you have all this potential. You're, you know, if you just applied yourself, you'd work pretty hard. And that year, leading up to age uh, 15, we went uh, to Indonesia on a travel trip. And so I had 100% uh, attendance for practice during that time. And then lo and behold, I actually qualified for junior nationals in every stroke and every distance and every event. Wow. And then got to junior nationals and wins the 400 I am. Well, so yep. that was all well and good. Uh, 432, um, dropped probably six or seven seconds. Couldn't believe I hit the wall first and it was pretty neat. Uh, I was invited to go to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. And it was the first ever training camp for youth development back in the day. Cynthia Woodhead was invited, Sippy Woodhead, Melanie Ryle, a couple of girls from our team that also had done really well. And I turned it down. Uh, mm -hmm. I had that summer my first boyfriend and I didn't want to lose his attention, but more importantly, I had my first alcoholic buzz. Wow. And as soon as I had that drink, it was like, all the pressure of swimming, all the expectations, all those hard workouts and the suffering, it was like somebody just let out this relief valve, like this big, pss, you know, where I just deflated. And I just love that feeling of that release. And I knew that at that moment, even though my dad was an alcoholic and I swore I would never be an alcoholic, I knew at that moment that I wanted that feeling again. And, and there became the battle between, um, you know, I wanted out of the pool and into the bottle and the bottle one. Uh, but I swam well enough until age 18 to get 15 full scholarship offers. It was 1980. I went on these wild recruiting trips, Georgia. Sorry, Jack Bowerly. I got so drunk on that recruiting trip that I barked in somebody's in somebody's dorm room, but Jack still got me up at 6 a.m. in the morning to do an, like a 7K practice. And the whole swimming pool, I'm by myself. He's giving me this workout. And, you know, Jack Bowerly, Olympic coach, is sitting there going, okay, well, she looks okay. And I'm sitting there like puking in the gutter again. And as soon as Jack left the building, I got out of the pool and got on a shuttle back to Atlanta. And that was the last I ever heard from the University of Georgia. So I, I chose the University of Arkansas. Um, not because of the great swimming program, because it didn't really have one, even though Sam Freeze was there and they had a really strong men's program, women's oh. program. I chose it because it was a lot of fun partying and there was a really cute guy there. <laughs> <laughs> priorities, priorities. Priorities, yeah. 
Anyway, um, long story short, on my college career, I ended up dropping in and out of school about six times, uh, wow. becoming uh, ineligible, uh, mostly because when you are in the disease of alcoholism, you end up kind of getting this blurry goggle um, feeling. Like you can only see what's right in front of you. Uh, it's very difficult to predict into the future. And, and what happens in early addiction is, first of all, you say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to get up and I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to rededicate myself and I'm going to go to practice and I'm going to use this potential. And then the next day you get up and by 12 o'clock you have a beer in your hand and you skip practice and you've done ditch classes and you, you lose. First thing you do is you lose trust in yourself. Trust yourself to do what you're going to say you're going to do. So you lose trust in yourself, which quickly turns into lack of respect for yourself. Mm-hmm. So when you don't respect yourself, you, you know, why, what's the point? I mean, you're a loser anyway. And then the next slide is into self-loathing and the self-loathing is what most people don't realize because every person that has an addiction issue knows about it. And if a coach sees a little hint of it, they're seeing the tip of the iceberg, which means somebody's let their guard down enough to show you that you have a problem because you keep that secret hidden, whether it's the eating disorder I had, whether it was the drinking, but you know, grades and going to class and flunking out, you can't hide that. And pretty soon, you know, you really can't hide from yourself. Um, But to jump now to the the world record. So um, in age 25, the impetus for me to go to, uh, uh, Houston for the Masters Nationals was I'd, I'd actually had to buy a bathing suit and it cost $50. And I remember Stu Isaac from Speedo, you know, always gave me free suits and I bought this suit. So I like, I had to show up. And so I actually trained. I was a beach lifeguard and I trained and I trained pretty hard. And that year I broke a uh, world record in the 400 I am, my first ever FINA world record. And wow. I celebrated by drinking a beer and then going home and moving to Mission Viejo for once again another fresh start now some people call them fresh starts but in reality what the alcoholic is doing at this point or drug addict is doing is what's called a geographical if i move somewhere to a new environment my problems won't follow me but they always do and within three weeks i was back home bartending in back into san diego and just the only thing that that world record taught me was that I did have the potential because I'm swimming faster than I did when I was a kid training on such a little amount and drinking the whole meat. Um, it just proved to me that I was a quitter and uh, that I did have the talent and I didn't deserve it. So um, that was pretty much the spiral from age 25 to 31 until I got sober was this just continuous poor choices, always hitting the pool. Um, but it got to the point where uh, in my in like 27, 28, since I was drinking 24 hours a day, um, I couldn't go to the pool anymore. Because I don't know if you've ever gone to swim practice when somebody's had a late night. Yeah. What And you can smell the alcohol on the yeah. breath. So they, I, couldn't yeah. go to a, I couldn't go to a, even a public pool because people would smell me. So my option was I would go in the middle <clears throat> of the day, drunk as a skunk, and I would swim in San Diego Bay by myself wow. drunk. And here's the thing, as an alcoholic, it made perfect sense to me. Look, I'm getting my workout in still, I'm still swimming, but I can't swim in the pool. Here's a irrational idea that, I mean, I'm dodging Navy vessels. You know, I would stop in at a bar and I'd say, hey, I'm gonna go swim in the bay. And if I'm not back in 45 minutes, send the Coast Guard out looking for me. You know, wow. and then I would proceed to go swim. And, and, and that's the, the craziness of the the disease of addiction is that you you can make something that seems so crazy perfectly rational and 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 that's where i ended up you know like you know you wanted to swim and the other part of me just said you can't swim you're drunk so you, you just said that you made a lot of poor choices but you definitely made you i read that you said that swimming was hard and drinking was easy and so you made a choice I mean, drink, drinking was, was, was a way to deal with a lot that was going on in your life. And, and a major part of that was some crazy tough swimming. You want to talk about that, that relationship between swimming and drinking? So, yeah. I think, I think the, the big question here really is we have talented athletes all over the world. And it's tough when you're one of them because you didn't choose it. 
it was a gift given to you and you feel an obligation to use it because you hear from your peers, you hear from your parents, you hear from the coaches, why are you wasting your talent? And you hear that and it goes somewhere. And what it does is each one of those is kind of like a tear in the fabric of your ego and your, your being. And the only way you feel like you can escape that is to alter your feelings with a substance, you know, whether it was drugs or alcohol or food, or now it could be anything, you know, I don't like the way I feel. I need to change that. And a go-to is a substance or a behavior that's not necessarily healthy for you. So um, swimming kind of, you know, the drinking numbed the pain of knowledge that I was wasting my talent and potential and I was mm. heading down a disastrous path, but yet I was powerless to stop it, even mm -hmm. though I knew the outcome was death. Yeah. You know? And it's a, it's a wild thing and something that anyone that's been around college athletics or elite athletes knows this is not a one-off story. This is a very common story. So what type of advice or things do you think we all could learn from your story or things to look out for with, you know, college athletes or even athletes younger than that age? Well, the first thing is, is your front line. Like for instance, you guys all swim masters, mm -hmm. right? And you have guys and people in your lane and, and now COVID's a little bit different, but you have people in the sphere of your life and if you don't see a friend of yours come to practice for a while, wouldn't you give them a call and say, hey, are you okay? Or a text, what's up, buddy? Why haven't you been coming to practice? When people are dealing with mental illness, it's really difficult to hide in a real easy way. So aversion is a great tactic. Is like, um, And one thing that they say like in AA is like, my disease wants to get me alone and then kill me. And no. that's exactly <laughs> is so coaches you notice a behavior of a kid changes right and this could be age 10 11 12 look in that lane are they getting bullied right what's going on at home what's what's it like when mom or dad picks them up what do you see what's you're a front line and then the people in your lane they see the same things and um you know i think is people if people actually really started talking about it and i think that it's so great that mental health issues are starting to come to the surface and be more publicized. Um, and there's no shame in, in these secrets. And that's why it's so beautiful with my book out. I can walk into any room and all my secrets are out there unless I get some new ones. And, <laughs> and, and I have nothing to hide. You know, I'm all out there, right? And yeah. we actually would be surprised that if we shared our secrets with our friends or the loved ones, that the response would not be what we think it is, which is, oh my God, what a loser, you suck. I don't wanna be around you. I think 100% of the people around you would say, what can I do to help? What do you need? Yeah, but and you know what? It's, it's, that's hard to do because I don't know what to look for. I, I, I swam masters with somebody eight years ago, the same team we we're on, John, with somebody, and he, he and I were good friends. We, he came to practice, Luke, you're coming tonight, I swim with him, really nice guy. Four years later, he committed suicide. I had no idea, nothing, because it's the tip of the iceberg. And how do I make myself more aware? How do how do we get that conversation going so coaches, teammates, friends uh, know what's going on underneath? You can't tell sometimes, right? But how, how can we help? That's that's great because you get really good at hiding it, and uh, and so that beneath the surface is really really what we're looking for. I think you just got to stay on on top of what your what your bubble and those people are doing and yeah. ask them how are you doing no how are you really doing right tell me how you feel and guys aren't necessarily able to talk about that girls we can talk about it doesn't mean that there's fewer suicides mm -hmm. but i do know that um it's it's very interesting once a person decides to commit suicide they're actually in a better mood than you've seen them in because they've made up their mind that they're they've so they're they're getting closer to what they perceive as freedom so if you see mood swings more towards manic happy not necessarily manic slow right now here's another thing you can look at men and women are have different ways of dealing with depression do you guys know the difference john i bet you you do no i don't i i'd love to hear more about it luke what do you think i i can uh, Go ahead. I'm going to guess, but go ahead. 
Like okay, we so don't women, talk. Women tend to sit on the couch. They close yeah. up. They cave in. No energy. Yeah. Hide from the world. That's a generalization. Men that suffered from depression, hyperactive, angry, yeah. risk-taking behavior. Basically, they feel dead inside and they want to feel alive. And yeah. so you have, and these are very, very generalized things. But if you have people, kids taking risks, taking behavior, what's where's that coming from, right? Yeah. There's something inside them that is crumbling, and they are trying to rekindle the endorphins to feel good about themselves through risky behavior. And then women, quiet, you know, hide. Um, not always the same. You know, you could have kind of a cross between those two. So, and they're just erratic behavior. No, it, 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 we talked about this a couple of times, though, John, about, and it's, a, it's an interesting point where we were told that in swimming, we work so hard to null pain because, you know, like that set, we can push ourselves harder. No, we can put, go through more pain. We can do one more hundred on a 110 pace. We can do, we can yeah. just null that pain, null that pain, null that pain, you know, lactic tolerance. That's basically trying to tolerate supreme pain throughout the whole body. How long can you do that for twice a week? That's what we train ourselves to do. <laughs> but that's the same part that, that helps pleasure and joy and happiness and openness and, and freedom. And so if we're numbing that, what else we have we numbed? And therefore, what do we do that's dramatic to, as you said, to, to, to go crazy and, you know, go cliff dive jumping or something? I don't know. Absolutely. Uh, and this is why um, I remember I was at Masters Nationals a couple of years doing some book signings. And, and um, Adam, oh, God, he was a backstroker from Shoulder YMCA. Yeah. Mania. Mania, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mania. yeah. He kicked my so, butt a few times. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so Adam and I used to go to the uh, Kermagee Elite Meet, Chesapeake Elite Meet in Oklahoma yeah. City, and, and I was the token old, old woman making finals, which was really <laughs> cool because, you know, Jenny Thompson and and Lee Loveless and all these, BJ Bedford, all these people were there, and Not I'm like fair. placing second behind BJ Bedford in the 200 backstroke, which is cool because yeah. I'm like 36. And she's Olympian. But, yeah. Yeah, BJ gave, gave me a wedgie behind the blocks. And she, said, <laughs> and she goes, I double dare you to swim with that. <laughs> like, BJ. <laughs> okay, so um, where were we on that topic? Oh, so Adam, is, we're talking about the book and recovery. And this older guy comes up, new to master swimming. He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Swimming is the most pleasurable thing for me. It's my meditation. It's my zen. It's my everything. And Adam and I just kind of looked at it. I said, well, it can be that, but let's take a look at it from the reality. Right. You get a, you get an, a sharp alarm clock at 4.30 in the morning. Yeah. All right. That means it's time to get out of that warm bed, get into a cold pool, yeah. And now not only are you going to be in this sensory deprived bathtub swimming yeah. back and forth, um, you're going to be judged. The clock is going to judge you. Your coach is going to judge you. Your teammates are going to judge you and you're going to judge yourself. Right? Have you yeah. ever gotten in the water and not looked at the clock and you go, man, I just feel so good. And you do a repeat and you see the clock and you go, oh, I suck. <laughs> just like that. You're Zen yeah. one to judgment. Yeah. Right. So. Mm -hmm. So that sensory deprivation, and then on top of that, Luke, what you're saying, this kill yourself, right? We're not, and then the five second rest intervals, yes. you know, the, the whole stuff is like the badge of courage to say, yeah, I won 2100s on 110, Hoo -hoo, yeah. you know, and basically you got like 30 seconds rest in 2000. Wow. <laughs> you know, but yeah, we get outside and we brag about that. You know, people mm -hmm. don't brag about, I did 2100s on two minutes and held 59. Yeah. They're like, dude, you took too much rest. Yeah. <laughs> Blacker. So so we have this sport that is is just like the atmospheric pressure of the water. It just weighs on you. And what do you want to do when you get out? You want to blow off steam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um and, and that's why you have such a prevalence of, of teenage alcohol abuse. And especially when they get to college, um, more time on their hands and nobody telling them no, you can't do that. So I think the slippery slope is really when you get into college, but the habits are formed probably latter high school parts, you know? So Definitely. What, what can, what can you do? You know, it's like, we really need to take a look at our sport and say, where are we, where are we, where can we, what can we do different? You know, what can we do? Different? Big time. Yeah. And like you mentioned, or we've been talking about, I mean, swimming, you know, has 
oddities and nuances that probably increase this prevalence even more. Uh, we were talking about the HBO documentary that Michael Phelps uh, is yeah. a part of called Way to Gold. So it's obviously in all sports. So what are some things you think USA Swimming or college sports could do to, to help out even more? Well, I think that it, it, USA Swimming and USA Sports probably are really starting to take a much better look at this, uh, this whole field. And, mm -hmm. and they and and create some really really um, effective programs uh, a couple of years ago I used to work for Girl Scouts and it was back when the Mean Girls movie was out and there's a, a book called Queen Bees and Wannabes and it's by Rosalind Weinberg or Weisberg and basically it describes the hierarchy of cliques with girls and we use that as a template to um, create an anti-bullying program for the Girl Scouts and Ira Klein was working with USA Swimming, and I said, you know, Ira, this would be really great to come up with a program like this for USA Swimming and Club Development mm -hmm. that would focus on the bullying, because why do kids quit swimming? Why? The, the, the peer pressure. Peer pressure. They want to go out and see, see girls, party, whatever. Yep. Peer pressure. Yeah. School. Yeah. But what, Time what commitment, volume. Yeah. Okay. How about this? So if you ask a 12, 13 year old kid, why do you like to go to practice? See my friends. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's but, right. See my have friends. Yeah, that, yeah. I have my best friends are at the pool, not in my yeah. school. Yep. And so swimming. why did the kid quit swimming? Yeah. They might not be getting any faster. So they could that could be one reason. Maybe somebody's bullying them in their lane. Yeah. And and those dynamics are and how are you supposed to avoid somebody in your lane who's making it miserable? And every time that I've asked a kid that's what that quit at like age twelve or thirteen, most likely they have told me. I said, "Were you being bullied?" And they'll think about it. They're like, "Yeah, his name was like Bobby Smith. And he used to pull on my suit all the time, and then he would grab my leg and he'd push me under, and the coach never saw it." And it's like, and I said, "Well, did you tell him?" I said, "Yeah, but nobody believed me," and and he kept swimming and I quit. Yeah, but it's also bullying from, there's no wrong word is bullying, but from the culture as well. We've seen some very dynamic coaches who are able to adapt their their, their, their character to each swimmer, which is fantastic. They make bottoms of the world, right? But yeah. but then you have the coaches who are just the one mindset, the one attitude for all 40 of them in the pool, sometimes 60 in the pool. And I understand that. you got crazy age group programs right now, and it's hard to adapt yeah. how you are. But some swimmers just will not work well with a coach shouting at them. Or some yep. customers will, will not be motivated if a coach does not shout at them. And so yep. uh, it's, uh, it's USA Swimming has got so big. We have so little well-coached coaches, I think, who are doing really good stuff, who are still st stuck in doing things that they were taught, not things that are best for their athletes. And I think we need to work on that, you know? I, I think so, too. And and so conventional wisdom is what we're doing, you know? Right. It is like you, you know, I was I was swimming in New Zealand last year and uh, there was New Zealand. Oh. Yeah, so it was beautiful. And <laughs> we go, I go to this public lap pool, right? And I see a, 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 a kids group training. So I approached the coach and I said, hey, can I swim with you? Because I have a USA swimming card and I swim USA swimming. And uh, she's like, well, sure. And, um, and so I swam in the next lane and I said, she said that older kids will be getting in in about an hour. I said, okay. So then I watched her give the set and it was, I don't know, something ridiculous with lots of butterfly and they were just warming up and she gave the stuff. She, the only time she spoke to the kids was when she was cor correcting them or yelling at them. And then she stood back and didn't say anything else. And so I didn't ever end up swimming with them. Um, I did kind of watch her as she emphasized the finish of the butterfly kick with the you know pole, like finish yeah. your stroke. And then I watched these kids limp through butterfly, getting stuck in the back. And and then I was thinking, oh, what are the the older kids going to look like? And luckily, they actually had some really nice butterflies. But anyway, so I get out and I talk to her. I said, why did you quit swimming? Because she was kind of young. She was just an assistant coach. She's like, I got burned out. I said, well, why? Yeah. And she said, well, you know, I just started getting slower and I was working so hard and I didn't see the results. I said, well, what did your coach said? He said, well, just work harder. And I just looked at it. I said, why don't you try and be the coach you always wanted to have? Why don't, why don't we perpetuate what we want in a coach what we've than what we've had? Because if you've left the sport and now are on deck and not pursuing your own dreams and goals and master swimming, something somewhere along the line that the chain broke. You have a chance to repair it. Be the coach you always wanted to have. 
And that's why master swimming is so wonderful. I, I, I honestly, when I was a cottage swimmer and national team swimmer, I was like, I'm, I'm never gonna be a master swimmer. Oh, come, no way, no way. That's like below me, <laughs> below me. Like, I'm look at yep. all the people, but master swimmers is so much higher than where I was emo emotionally and physiology. This, this, this psychology, it, it's, it's me being the swimmer that I that's best for me. I and I push myself just as hard as I did in college in sets. I have the independence, I have the accountability because I have the maturity and it's such a wonder. And I have the camaraderie that I choose to be there and I don't miss a practice if John's there. And that's the beauty of master swimmers. And you, I'm, we're talking to the, the, one of what, 14 Hall of Fame swimmers who are master swimmers in the Hall, Hall of Fame pool, one of 14 maybe. Talk to me about your master's career. What happened at age 31, four years later, you broke every single world record in every event in every <laughs> stroke which is ridiculous and then you went on what would happen to your master's career go ahead <laughs> well luke's looking for tips by the way that's what he's asking for in all honesty well, not in breaststroke <laughs> I, I am set two days ago it was terrible i'm never doing breaststroke again no <laughs> Well, so my mother intervened and I got into a rehab. Um, I was near death, uh, but like I said, powerless to stop it. And um, after I came out of the rehab, uh, I went to this uh, AA Alcoholics Anonymous retreat. And by the way, it's really cool because AA has that word anonymous in it. Yeah. But there's now all kinds of open groups. And instead of these, like, we have these code words to find out, ooh, do you like, do you know Bill W? Do you know? And that's like secret to find who each other are. That stuff's kind of blown up now with Facebook and anonymity is a choice now. And it's really nice because I think we need to share our stories, not be hiding in downstairs church rooms with secret handshakes and yeah. like a, our own personal clique. We need to be out in the world, you know? Um, so I get uh, I get sober. It was hell, uh, hallucinations, DTs. You know, a lot of people don't realize that you can die from alcohol withdrawal. Uh, yeah, and right. I was on I was on 24 hour watch. The nurses had uh, I was malnourished because I was still bulimic as well. Malnourished, and my potassium levels were barely alive. And probably if I had, my mom had not intervened. I would be dead over the weekend because my blood wow. alcohol was 0. 0.52. <gasps> yeah. So I weighed 115 pounds. I was 5'8", 115 pounds. And the crazy thing is when my mom, uh, there's a story before that, but when we were waiting for the bed in the rehab, we were in the emergency room. And we waited for an hour and a half for them to admit me. And I'm talking like I am right now because I can, nobody knows I'm drunk. Nobody knows. I'm. That's just normal. The only thing that when it wasn't normal was if I dip below a certain level of alcohol in my system, I get violently sick and shake. So you had to have a drink. It wasn't a choice anymore. It was this, you know, you're wrestling with the devil. If you drink, you're going to pass out. And if you don't drink, you're going to get sick and throw up. So you had to kind of choose your evil and try and find a middle, you know, middle ground. And it was pure hell. You know, you're just waking, you're coming to and passing out and coming to. So we're sitting there in the emergency room and my mom leans over and she's a master swimmer, Adrian. Um, and she leans over and she goes, well, you know, it's a good thing you're not dying. Well, she's a medical technologist. When she got the lab report, she's like, holy crap, Carlin, you were dying. Wow. And so I was very, very lucky to be alive. And, and when I turned the corner in the rehab, I realized that I had been given a gift and that God had decided that I was given this life back again. And there was probably something for me to do and figure that out. So I got back in the pool, but not right away. Um, I went to this retreat with my brother, who's also in the program. Uh, that's what we call the program, 12-step um, program. And there was a little campground pool, you know, like one of those little kidney-shaped pools. And I got in the water and I just like, it just felt so good. And, you know, I was just thinking that the water would tell me, like, you know, like scream at me and say, Carlin, you really screwed up. You took that too far. That was a close call. It didn't say anything bad. It just said, come on back. I'll make you well. And I did wow. this laugh back and forth in this little pool. Boom, 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 boom. That was great. Well, then I get back to Coronado and I go jump in, go to jump in a 50 meter pool. Well, this is a real pool. And all of a sudden I have these voices in my head and the, all of the monkeys are on my back and the monkeys are saying, you know, Carlin, you really screwed up you had it all you had all these opportunities and you threw them away and 
so then I had this little conversation with myself and it was like, okay, so if you never swim faster than a two minute hundred freestyle ever again, are you going to be okay with that? And it's like, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, if you never break a record, never win a gold medal, never go do anything significant with swimming, is that going to be okay? And I'm like, yeah. And then my little voice said, okay, jump in or dive in. And I dove in and you know, the rest is kind of aquatic history. Wow. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and like you said, a, an amazing story. And obviously you've done so much since then from breaking records to doing other amazing things to doing speaking engagements and all this. And it's just, it's something to, I, I, I look up to and it's, uh, it's amazing. So thank you for, for sharing that story. Um, one interesting thing that's going on in, in the swimming world right now is obviously mm-hmm. last year, the ISL started a professional swimming league and it's yeah. giving some swimmers the opportunity to make more money. And obviously you've, you know, done a lot with your, your swimming and, you know, go speaking and do clinics and all that. Do you have any advice for those swimmers that are trying to make a living at it at that level? That's, that's a great question. Um, so we spoke, you know, looks at mentioned conventional wisdom. Mm-hmm. You know what? I don't, I don't really watch other people's stuff. You know, first of all, you figure out what your learning style is and then you test things out. And I'm really grateful I have an endless pool because that's probably the most influential piece of in, that I've had because the endless pool is, Luke, you know, it doesn't lie. If you no. do something that makes your stroke go faster, you run into the front of the current, the motor, so to speak. If you yep. do something that makes you go slower, you get pushed back. It's science. It's not a coach. And so that has really shaped me. But find a few key people that you really are on the same page with and stick to your guns and don't be afraid to have a different voice. So I can't tell you how many customers or clients come to me and they, I say, well, what's your philosophy? You know, total immersion, swim smooth, whatever, or Red Cross, s pole, And they're like, oh, nothing, I'm totally uncoached. And then, and then within five minutes, they've mentioned five YouTube videos and this and that and the other. <laughs> Keep it simple. Be confident in what you are teaching and stay in the pool and stay relevant. Doesn't mean that you got to be racing, but you got to test your own theories, whether you're in a regular pool or an endless pool or an ocean. You can't just be spouting off other people's stuff. And, and then, you know what? And to really have an honest uh, purpose um, behind the reason why you want to get into coaching. Like, I really love helping people figure it out. I might only see them one time, so I'm going to give them so much information, and it's all backed up on video. I just film them with their own their own camera, their own the phone, so that they have all that information so that they can continue to make improvements. And then I tell people, look, after today, there's only one voice you should listen to, one voice alone, me. <laughs> <laughs> and don't stray away. <laughs> today when you get new information and it sounds intriguing take it to the laboratory test it compare it to what you currently have if you have found something that works for you dump the old and go with the new and don't be don't let your ego get in the way of saying look i got new stuff you know forget that old stuff but let's try it and now compare it and let people contrast this and that good and bad new and old and the trick is if you can encourage people to believe that faster swimming feels like less that's the feeling we want tailwind swimming the less you feel in the water the faster you're going the more you feel in the water the harder you're working and the sign of a bad pull is a heavy kick especially with beginners yeah absolutely you know and, that's and, the, and this pool shows it yeah what? it's like and then just have them drag your legs <laughs> then they'll force the pull to start activating. But, yeah. yeah. And don't be, be change. So before we get into that stage, you, so you made your comeback. You, you're a little bit older than me, but not that much, honestly. And you've made your comeback when I started takeoff and swimming. This is in the 90s, right? So you made your comeback in the early 90s. And that's when I really got serious about swimming at college and national team and stuff. Um, in the 90s, there weren't that many pro swimmers. If you got paid to swim, it was because you were funded by making a national team for your country. Or maybe there was a club in France who flew you to France to swim nationals. Me? Maybe you had, a, you, had a, you had a sponsor from Speedo if you had made the World Games or something. 
Matt Biondi may have been sponsored, but nobody got sponsored, especially not a master swimmer at age 36. Yeah. How did that happen? Well, you know, I really have never gotten sponsored. And it was funny because right before I went to go swim, uh, do film my first go swim video with Glenn Mills. Love man. Um, I had a meeting with Speedo. And um, and I've known that Speedo rep for since I was a teenager. Yeah. And I had this whole portfolio of me wearing Speedos. I mean, I never wore Aced in anything but Speedos. I always branded and logoed myself up looking like I was. So when I came to touch, like, what am I going to wear in this DVD? I thought now's a great time to approach Speedo. And, you know, I've loved Speedo all my life. But I sat down with this high up rep and he just goes, I'm sorry, we don't sponsor Masters Athletes. And I, I'm like, but wait a second. I just swam collegiately where I won three events at NC2As. Yeah. Set an NC2A record. record. I swim USA swimming. I'm an open water swimming swimmer. Uh, and I'm a master swimmer. I'm not just, just a master swimmer. You want to cover Swimming World magazine multiple times. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> They didn't bite, and it just kind of to me what it what it said was, you know, sometimes you have misplaced loyalty, and I appreciate the years that I got free suits, but there's really not a lot of money out there. There's a lot of product, and what I do is I just if I enjoy the product and I feel it works, I endorse it wholeheartedly, and I, I post about it on social media. But um, yeah, money wise, I think the money is going to be made in in sharing that knowledge, whether you're speaking, whether you're doing clinics, which is basically a trade. I'm getting paid to share my knowledge. Um, and uh, the book's not really making much money, but it's helping a lot of people. So that's great. <laughs> you know, the, the sharing knowledge thing is a, a small shout out to what John, Brian, myself, and, and, and Justin are doing. You know, we the reason I enjoy doing this a lot is we get to meet some amazing people and talk about really important topics. We've talked, besides what we talk about today, so many other things. And I just, there's so many of these podcasts out there and so much of this information out there. It's ridiculously amazing for us swimming nudes. And we need to get that out there. And I just want people to be able to share. And like, you know, Brett Hawk just finished talking to Kathleen Baker. And Kathleen, you want to know how Kathleen's mindset is and how she is? Listen to that stuff. She is amazing. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, uh, uh, Daniel Kowalski, just going to talk about what made him one of the toughest swimmers in the world on Off The Box podcast this week. We should be following that and they should be hearing what you say just now and going out there. We need to share knowledge and that's our wealth. That's our wealth in swimming in our community. So somebody in Kenya, somebody in, in the Ukraine can benefit from what you have and not have to follow your path, they have a different path. What exactly. And, and that's the thing is, so, um, so my dad was a music teacher um, and even though he was an alcoholic, he was a very, very gifted uh uh, music teacher as well as being a gifted musician and for the longest time I thought that the only thing that I inherited him was his blue eyes his dimples and his gene for alcoholism which there's actually 40 genes but I realized later on that my dad gave me this wonderful gift of teaching so I have learned and this is one of the biggest takeaways from dealing with uh, setbacks and circumstances in life reframe if you learn how to reframe any situation your life will be great because the negative that's coming at you you can flip it around to a positive and we don't know what the big plan is for us and right. we think that these little tiny setbacks mean don't go down this path no just keep trying but if you get a lot of resistance maybe it's time to go in a different direction but if you learn the art of reframing you will be a much happier person because no matter what happens to you, you can turn it, you can put a positive spin on it. And I think that's what champions do yes. with races. They don't learn from the wins. They learn from, they learn from when things didn't go the way they'd planned. And I certainly didn't plan to be an alcoholic, but I swear that it's the best thing that's ever happened to me because it's given me this appreciation for life. And it's giving me this understanding of how many people are out there suffering. And when, when I see somebody that's angry and ornery I, I, or, or sharp or whatever, I think, I wonder what's going on at home or I wonder what's going on inside. I'm always thinking what's below the surface, you know, because I, I've been given that sight because I've been there myself. And, and the, the gift of swimming coaching is great, you just, but you just give it away, right? I, you put the stuff up and, yep. and hopefully somebody grabs it and runs with it and then, then they share it. Because there's got to be a, a, a good, solid voice out there that says, look, 
try everything and figure out what works best for you. There are not many female coaches out there, though. And 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 to, in, to a quick segue to Kim Bracken being announced as one of the coaches of the and the ISL. So you got a female, another female coach in professional swimming, which is fantastic. Talk to me about about your feeling about you know there is a huge gender equality, inequality gap in swimming at the coaching level. You know, besides especially the pro level. Talk about that. What, what, I mean, the importance of that, eh, John? Well, actually, let me ping that back to John. So yeah. you've been around, you guys have both been around Division One swimming. You would think yeah, definitely. college swimming programs. And, and to be fair, I had my prejudices too. So when I swam at Palomar College, my coach was Patty Waterman. Yeah. And um, she qualified for trial swimming for Mike Troy back in the 60s. Yeah. So we had a great connection there. And then yeah. when I swam at Cal State Bakersfield on a scholarship when I was 35, I had Pat Skihan. Now, at that time, the men were, had been under Ernie McGlishko, yeah. and Bob mm -hmm. Steele took over. So they had this winning streak. Well, the year that I swam at Bakersfield with one year of eligibility, Pat, Pat was known for taking local girls, local California girls, and making them better. And so by the time she's graduating a senior class, and these are kids that are all from local California places, we're swimming fast, and we got second at NC2As. Wow. And he's got this fantastic pedigree, but who's heard of Pat Skeen, right? Yeah. Um, and I just think that we just have to open up and say, look, um, women can coach just as effectively as men, but it also, you just have to understand what kind of style and how do you respond to that? And yep. if you're mm -hmm. looking at a, if you're looking at a college program and there's a male coach versus a female coach, don't look at the sex of the coach, talk to the kids on the team ask them what's really going on. And that's what I did with Terry McKeever. I knew nothing about Pat when I was going from San Diego to Bakersfield. And I reached out to Terry McKeever, who I grew up swimming with at Cal, at Cal Berkeley, right? And, mm -hmm. and Terry goes, you know, I don't know much about Pat, but her girls always look happy. And that counts for something. And Big time. I, uh, I just tucked that in there. And, you know, I went up to Bakersfield for one semester or one year, and I ended up staying two and finished graduating. So. Mm -hmm. And like you said, I think looking at the team, how happy are they? What are they doing after swimming? You know, yeah. are are they graduating? What types of things are they doing after then? Are they happy after swimming as well? Because even at the elite level, not many make it. Even with the ISL and things like this, we had an interesting conversation um, last week about the ISL and how maybe prolonging careers could just stunt people's overall professional development or mental development too by holding on for so long. And it's, you know, be, you know, the ISL or swimming is such a crucial part of their whole persona that development might get stunted, but nonetheless, yeah. it's important to know what's going on with these athletes afterwards. But all, like you said, are they happy within it is, is a huge thing and something that's probably easier to manage or measurable than obviously long-term. Yeah. And you know, it, it was, when I was coached by Mike Troy, he was also a real estate agent because back then he was a fabulous coach. You know, I, in my book, I talked to him about him like a crazy uncle. You know, you loved him and you hated him at the same time. And anybody sw that swam for Mike in Coronado Navy or Walnut Creek or out at Rio Salado would say the exact same thing. Mike was pretty consistent all the way across um, as far as being a crazy uncle. <laughs> but he was brilliant, right? But back then, you couldn't just be a swim coach. Yeah, You know, it, you had to have some other career. Um, as far as ISL, the beauty of, um, I think, where we're heading in swimming training and realizing that less is more, especially with an older athlete. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that Pat at Bakersfield did, she goes, you know, Caroline, I don't want to get you behind the eight ball. So she really focused on uh, zone one, zone two, zone three, or EN1, EN2. And basically it was a menu of things based on our time 30 minute swim. Which back then, I had a time 30-minute backstroke swim, which I think I held 109s for 2,000 yards. Jesus. One day. So, yeah, my freestyle was uh, I held 105s for a 30-minute swim. So I was doing pretty good. Um, but she just she knew that she didn't want to dig me in a hole because that's the thing is the older you get, the longer it takes to rest. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking with ISL, these guys aren't needing to swim five hours a day. So they have time to Good explore time. other passions. So mm -hmm. I would say keep a backup plan. Like I look, Jenny Thompson, she's a doctor now. You know, yep. you don't have to just be a swimmer. You can be a writer. You could be a blogger. You could be, um, um, you could do all kinds of things and and uh, have a fallback because otherwise, as you probably noticed in the weight of gold, 
once your career is over, especially if it's not your choice, you're kind of stuck out in the middle of no man's land, you know? So this, find your path and then pursue it. You just mentioned that 109 holding backstroke and um, Bob Bowman just posted a 2004 set of Phelps um, and, and, and um, Clement and they did an 800 backstroke. You know, you know, Michael did. So <laughs> he went 819, then a 600 backstroke, 558, a 400 backstroke, 347, 400 backstroke. Okay. <laughs> and then, and oh, by the way, that's after he did a 200 free, 400 free, 600 free, 800 free. His 800 free was 737. Then he did that in backstroke and he ended up with a 347, 400 backstroke. That is incredible. Okay, no wonder Michael 2004 just tore it up in Athens. Anyway, that was um, that wow, was, that was insane. Him and, and Kevin Clement. So, um, I want to talk to you about about these elite athletes and what they're doing now. Because you do, you said you touched swimming once in a while, and you started doing something which I heard is popular these days: open water swimming and triathlon. I heard it. I heard it might catch on one day, especially in Kona where you live. I think triathlon <laughs> might be big in Kona one day, maybe. A little bit, maybe. <laughs> Maybe, but not, but not in San Diego either. Not in San Diego. No, <laughs> who does that in San Diego? <laughs> um, so we had almost had a world record in the pool at the Seti Kali meet. It was one of the first big meets we had back since COVID, where Palantrini went fourteen thirty three, which is incredible to to yeah. just to just scare the world record by two seconds, you know, um, in in the mile. Um, and he was well ahead of everybody else, so fifteen seconds ahead against the other guy. And then a couple of days later, he did the Italian open water swim. He did a 10K swim, and he won it, set an Italian record, went uh, one hour, 52 seconds. Um, the, how, 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 how do you go from a pool swimmer swimming a mile in the water first to open water swimmer 10K? That transition is, must be really tough, Carl, Colin. I mean, talk about that. I don't do that. I would never think about doing that. Um, that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you live in Hawaii like I do, uh, open water swimming year-round is pretty much inaccessible. So, uh, and this is a great triathlete question as well, because a lot of uh, open water swimmers and triathletes will get out of the pool from the winter and then get into the open water exclusively in the summertime. And what happens is, is that when you get in the open water without the boundaries of the pool, it's, it's quite entertaining and you're with your friends. Well, what happens is about throughout a couple of weeks, maybe four weeks goes by of just doing open water training, you start to detrain and the reason is what are you not getting that you would be getting in a pool training? Yeah, turns? Turns, turns yeah. Big time. yeah yeah turns stream underwater line. kicks streamline so every time you do a turn it's a burpee whether it's an open turn or a closed turn so say you go from a 5,000 yard workout you just had to 200 burpees so your core starts to detrain and um then you're also there's very little accountability right so you're not pushing your heart rate up to high levels so my point is is most good open water train swimmers are going to do a fair amount of pool training especially 50 meters and then they can carry that over into the open water quite easily what happens is if you're just swimming open water and then you go back into the pool like i haven't been in the pool since march but i've been swimming pretty regularly it's going to be painful that first slip turn I'm yeah sure. but it, 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 there's a lot more to that because he doesn't swim with water very often and open water swimming is a lot more than just his, his, his physiology and his mindset it's the yeah. spotting you know that it's it's yeah. spotting it, it's it's an experience so and he he, he beat these amazingly um experienced open water swimmers it's a whole different sport almost isn't it but, but you know if it was short course that he knocked you know rattled the world record i'd say that's a whole different animal because that's a turning and underwater event right but mm -hmm. to me a 50 meter is only you know, you're, you're going yard, eight mm -hmm. meters underwater. So you're 16 meters out of 100 is a push off flip turn. And the rest of it is actually swimming. So I think it translates well. Plus, he knows how to suffer. You know, he knows how to how suffer. To suffer. we talked about that. Know how to suffer. Yeah. They thought, you know, you know, if you read uh, Iron Wars, who's who can suffer the most, you know? <laughs> so so I think open water swimming is great. But I do want to touch on, you know, we were talking about Michael Phelps and the backstroke. Yeah. The years that, OK, I have a journal from when I swam when I was a kid. I love to do almost all my training backstroke. And I even at age 13 complained when I didn't get to do as much backstroke as I wanted. 
when I was in Bakersfield, I would regularly do a 115 base. Um, so I'd go 400, two twos, 400, four ones, all in a 115 base. And I'd go backstroke. And I'd just roll at the back of the lane so I didn't have to turn around people. And, you know, I'd be swimming pretty darn fast. The years that I trained lots of backstroke, my freestyle was on fire. My backstroke was on fire. The year that I focused on freestyle, my backstroke went in the tank. Wow. And, yeah, and, and my fly has been pretty steady the whole time. So um, I, there's something to be said about backstroke training, the unwinding, the opening up the chest, um, being able to breathe more frequently, um, that I think is that directly translates to good. Yeah, yeah, Nathan talked about that, being able to have an ample oxygen supply all the time. You just work yeah. your leg that much harder, eh, John? And, and what it does do, it does a lot more higher intensive training, especially for the biggest muscles in your body, right? Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I think, yeah, mixing it up, obviously we do so much stuff in the pool already volume wise, especially traditional training. And, I'm, and we talked about it a little, the volume's going down a little, but nonetheless, I think having a break, working some of the different muscle groups while still working on the most important thing for swimming, which is your body alignment, which is somewhat similar on backstroke. I definitely think can translate over and like you said, keep it interesting, keep it fun. All these things that are crucial. But yeah. it's got to be the same axis, the same long axis. Like, I don't know how you guys, how you train because you do those strokes. You switched up the long and short axis strokes. I, I to, to do IM sets, yes, but to swim a fly set and then do a freestyle set or something, it's it's a whole different feel. <laughs> well, Big time. So, so I have renamed the strokes. All right. So, <laughs> so I suck, don't suck, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I don't swim butterfly. I swim scooter fly. It's a, it's a one kick butterfly where you're just basically paddling your arms with a high elbow catch and an early exit out. That's my fly. Exactly. <laughs> Don't, and the Luke. If, yeah. If you Google there, there's some articles on out there about my scooter fly, but if you, if you, uh, Google Michael Troy, Michael Troy, Mike Troy, 1964, 200 butterfly on YouTube. There's a 220 butterfly. Yep. Of him so, swimming. Uh, and I swear to God, okay, now he swam for councilman and we were all doing the keyhole, but watch his stroke. Mm -hmm. One up, one down, short pull, light kick. Now, just look at the guys even doing the 50s these days are not busting the big kick. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at that, uh, the what's the guy that, um, the 35-year-old guy that broke the world record um, in the 50 fly, that it was at a, one of the FINA World Cups. Um Look at his, his heels are barely breaking the surface. Sure. So, real yeah. tight, real narrow. Real tight, real narrow. So scooter fly, not butterfly, or sucky fly. fly. Sucky fly. Sucky <laughs> fly. <laughs> okay, backstroke. I now slap the back of my hand. I do not go pinky first. In 1984, I want to say it was Rowdy's coach, but Rowdy's coach in 84 was Richard, right? But there's a coach that came to Trinidad, and he did a training camp with me. I was 10 years old, and I remember him saying, I can coach backstroke blind. I can just listen to you slapping, <laughs> slapping, 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 slapping. And I kept thinking, why do I want to slap? But okay, the, the, the Rowdy's coach says he got to slap, so I'm going to slap. <laughs> so, so if you want to set up a high elbow catch on your back, an early vertical forearm in your back, if you're driving your pinky down two feet, that's like the equivalent of saying, go deep catch freestyle. We want to bring the power zone closer. So it right. doesn't matter how your hand goes in. And this came from one of my clients who swims at um, Auburn and she's a breaststroker and uh, Val, uh, Val Tarazi. Uh, so she's an Olympic trial breaststroker, but she goes, oh God, my backstroke sucked. And I watched it. And actually I, Dave Marsh had me look at Nick Thoman yep. and his backstroke yep. a couple of years yep. ago. And I'm like, yeah, it looks perfect to me. He's got a deep cat, good big S pole. And I'm like, well, Val said her coach at, at uh, Auburn said slap her hand. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> no, well, that's hermetic. You can't slap your hand in back. You go pinky first, slice the cake, slice the cake. And but I had to try it. And when I tried it, I was immediately more opened up in the chest area. And my hand comes back, not near the head, but it, a little bit back here. And what that does is it stops all the water splash from hitting your face. And as your hand goes in, it drops down about six to eight inches. You tuck the elbow and, and then you engage your pull right away. And then you're out because your hand's near the surface. You haven't gone down to go up, to go down again. And what happens is not only can you breathe more, your chest is more, your hips right higher and your legs get 
off the hook. Well, there's somebody who took it to the next level on our show. John, do you remember Marge Holzer? He mm -hmm. she had her thumb first. Yes, yes, I saw yep. picture. Auburn yeah. Trimmer. Yeah. So you, try it. you go, you go, okay, let me yeah. go pinky first, see the slice the cake, then go palm flat, and then go even thumb in. Because what happens is your whole arm is what creates the indention for your, your shoulder to punch it down a little bit. But you don't and then watch Mia Dorado, Dorado. She's oh, beautiful. Yeah. 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 So yeah. so so that's called the slap happy backstroke. <laughs> <laughs> and it works. Excellent. I taught a lot of people how to do that. And then breaststroke, I just gone back to flatter. I don't have a good breaststroke. Yet. So it's not swimming. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then freestyle, you know, the fly catch is the same as the free catch. So in the middle of a workshop for triathletes, I will stop everybody and I don't tell them that I'm going to teach them scooter fly, but I do. I get an entire pool of triathletes doing butterfly. And then I say, okay, now let's go halfway fly and halfway free. And ta-da, they've got their high-able catch with a slightly wider than shoulder weight entry. So, yeah. Excellent. So, so all these changes have come in the last year and I just tell people, hey, why not change? You can always go back to your old way, right? Absolutely. Definitely. And now we got Justin back in because I think we have a great segue into an audience question that will tie in great. All right, Justin. Well, we have one audience que audience question from uh, Lyndon. She asks, how did you create your coaching philosophy? Oh, great question. Um, two things. I read an article by Casey Converse in an ASCA magazine many, many years ago, and it was entitled Hold On Loosely. And instead of looking at the, the outliers and thinking that that's crazy, the Janet Evans, the people that have these wacky strokes, you look at what they have in common. A good swimmer looks relaxed. A good swimmer has balance. And a good swimmer is moving forward and it doesn't look like they're working hard. Effortless effort, relaxed, balanced power. And that's what we're seeing. Doesn't mean that they're not working. And that coaching mm -hmm. philosophy is basically it. When I see a lot of extra work going on, I have to identify what is the symptom and what is the disease because the symptom can be masquerading as the disease. So for instance, John T. Skinner in the, um, a couple of days ago posted uh, two guys side by side um, and said, what's different about this stroke? And I noticed a scissor kick on the swimmer B. Well, a scissor kick is a sign of loss of balance. And that's directly related to the pull and probably the length of the pull. So um, dig a little deeper. Don't just, um, and figure out how to connect with whoever you're working with, whatever. I mean, paddle your body like a surfboard. Keep the, keep the terminology simple and easy to understand. When you breathe, talk to the fishies. You know, <laughs> keep it wide, ride the glide, especially on the breathing side. You know, little like that reach big, pull short, snappy little one-liners people can remember. And no, that, no, yeah, no, no, you're huge. Spot, you're spot on. I talked huge. about this the other day, and and so John's a PT, and he's fixed about a hundred injuries in my old man body already. And I remember I go to John with a shoulder injury, and John goes, "Okay," and he'll go down by like my the other shoulder. I'm like, "I know, I said this shoulder." Okay, I know, Luke, and he'd be all the way on the other side. So he would go for cause, and that was the symptoms, and that's the exact analogy. And all my injuries have been cured, and he strengthened yeah. it. And he worked on the imbalance, and he worked on the problem that's causing the symptoms. And you know, and a lot of coaches, it's unbelievable. They just say, "Finish longer." Well, how? How do I finish longer? Why am I finishing so short? Yeah, and you know, a lot of times people go. A big one is, and and this is something John T said at the uh, college coaches conference. The feet, what you see from behind really tells the good story. Well, that's so, a good idea. Okay, so um, Dave Marshall, drop another name again, had me watch Nick Brunelli. Yeah. He was a world record holder at the time. He, he let me swim with, Dave let me jump in with Colin and Nick and all these guys. And, yep, so and, and, uh, and he's like, Carlin, why is, why is Nick, not uh, Nick Brunelli, why is he scissor kicking? And I'm like, because he's taking a breath. And he doesn't breathe when he swims a short course meter freestyle. But every time he's taking a breath, his hands drifting into the center. He falls on the arm. The shoulder falls. The hip falls. Right. The feet scissor apart to counterbalance. I call that the death spiral. So what is he really doing? Well, when he takes that breath, he's letting his pole arm drag too far back. Think if you're in a kayak. If you're in a kayak and you let that paddle go back too far, what's the boat going to do? It's going to go in that direction the boat's going to start sinking and you're going to have to do something to get back up again. So really the symptom is 
the feet, the hip falling, the shoulder falling, and the arm dropping. But the disease is your pull on your breathing arm is too long, creating that domino effect. Absolutely. So, so you got to kind of look up the line and go, don't just strap a, a, something on somebody's feet and say, that fixes the feet problem. Fix the <laughs> breathing problem. Oh, here's a great question for you guys. I know we're running out of time. It's fine. All good. We're in, all good. All good. In the four strokes, you guys, and this is huge. In the four competitive strokes, freestyle has one major difference than fly, back, and breast. What is it? Luke, Justin, it's all you guys. <laughs> the only thing I can think of is breathe to the side, but you I've always it. been told. Oh, I did. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Okay. Because the okay. only, yeah, because the stroke, all the four strokes, at least what I've been told in the new thing is like the cats is similar. All the same. Okay. <laughs> yep. So mm -hmm. now you've got a nine pound noggin in freestyle. And you're welcome, Lyndon. Thanks. Um, so in backstroke, butterfly, and breaststroke, your head is staying in line with your spine. Now, freestyle, we have to turn our head to get a breath. Okay. So every time you're moving your nine pound bowling ball to the side, you're going to create an imbalance. So, you know, when we watch Michael Phelps swim with his asymmetrical freestyle, he's trying to create, and he's breathing every two, he's trying to create an, that counterbalance by doing that loping stroke. So his breathing pole is shorter than his non-breathing pole. You swim asymmetrical to be symmetrical and move straight forward. So balance. Your number one goal in freestyle is balance. And the number one goal in fly back and breast is keep your butt up. Mm-hmm. Simple. Coach around that. Keep your butt up, back, breast, fly, and like keep that. balance in freestyle. And that's why I endorse the slightly wider than shoulder hand entry, yeah. because when my hand is out here, I'm creating a nice Y in mm -hmm. the back. If my hand drifts into the center, I'm going to be skinny in the front, and then I'm going to be fat in the back. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to create, stop all the wiggling. And that's, Luke, when you saw your, your image in the analyst pool, you yeah. probably looked down and said, what's that guy doing? Yeah, who is that guy? I didn't recognize him. It wasn't me. Yeah, it's a lie. <laughs> it's not true. Excellent. Well, those are some huge tips. And like you said, having some simplicity and the things that you're looking, being able to translate it to people is huge, no matter what level they are. Because if the person doesn't get it, it's not going to happen. So being able to connect all those dots is great. So thanks for sharing those tips there. And that was a great question from the audience and a great way to go about it because that's a, a loaded question for sure. But now we want to wrap up with some great rapid fire questions here. So Luke and I are going to go back and forth with some rapid fire. So I'll get us started off here. Okay. Hardest race in swimming. Day, toughest race in swimming? 200, yep. butterfly, 200 butterfly long course. Oh, yeah. Followed by 400 I am. All right. Mm -hmm. Luke. Any distance of any distance. <laughs> Uh, you, 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 you mentioned um, her name a couple of times. Who's the better swimmer, you or Terry McGreever? Hey, Terry won USA Nationals in the 200 Butterfly back when she was a collegiate swimmer. Um, I, I'd say if Terry, if Terry wasn't spending her energy uh, empowering other people to swim fast, she would probably be a better swimmer than me. All right. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite easy swimming tip that you give your athletes? Paddle your body like a surfboard with a drink on your back that you don't want to spill. <laughs> Preferably non-alcoholic. In other words, keep the balance so you don't tip it over. Oh, Ledecky's glass of milk. But we all did that, didn't we? So. Oh, no, that was cute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you you've raised a lot of um you've raised a lot of of, of really well known swimmers. I mean, legends in the sixties and seventies and the eighties with master swimmers from Jesse Fasalo to um you know Rowdy and all these people. But how many race? How many swimmers head to head? What's the, what's the most famous swimmer you've raced head to head and beaten? Oh. You know what? I don't even know if I'd be able to answer that. Um, no, I, I, there's no, there's no answer for that. Yeah, there's no oh. answer. But I do have, I do have a cool story. And I'll make it really short. When I went to NC2A's Division Two, first of all, that was my ultimate do-over. Was yeah. getting back on a college deck at age 35. I mean, I just balled my head off. And then also making senior nationals when I was 34. That was really cool. But um, the meet was, NC2As were held in Canton, Ohio. Does anybody remember what happened in 1978 in Canton, Ohio? They hosted the USA Nationals. Oh. So the meet record board was 
Tracy Calkins, Melissa Bo Below, you should see it. It's like crazy. Well, the 200 Baxter pool record, Linda Yazik, Swam at Santa Clara, my idol. Yeah. So I gunned for not just the NC2A record, but for that pool record. Because mm -hmm. I used to walk around when when Linda Yazik was on the cover of Swimming World magazine. I poked yeah. out my eyes and walked around the uh, Santa Clara Invitational going, Hi, my name's Linda Yazik. John does that this day. Don't worry. <laughs> All the time. Anyway, long story short, I missed. I wanted 20054. The two, well, pool record was 20052. But I thought 20 years later, I'm trying to break my idols record. I didn't quite get it, but it was still something that I really really thought was really cool and and going back to college and being able to do it over and do it right was fantastic get grade good grades um and and then to be a part of a team our cal state bakersfield we got second so it wasn't yeah. just about me winning it was going for the wins for my team and and that really helped me step outside my own ego of breaking records it was for the team and for that you know i just completely uh, grateful to pat skiing at cal state bakersfield who she's now at laverne and the opportunities and that's the biggest thing is is people there were people along the way that believed in me before i believed in myself and that was crucial because i had these angels that would say carlin you want to go to community college let's see if you have eligibility that was patty waterman pat skian carlin do you want to you know think about coming to cal state bakersfield on a full scholarship oh, i'm not sure okay yeah and and then when i got sober uh, John Baker, he was my boss. He didn't fire me. He should have fired me. Um, he was he was a swimmer from Seattle area, and he was my boss at the Navy base, and he didn't fire me, and then eventually gave me a, a full-time job with benefits, and that's when I went back to school. So wow. swimming gave me my body back, but, but school gave me my brain back, and I got to finish yeah. what I started 19 years ago. So swimming is just such a wonderful catalyst for so many uh, – wonderful positive things in our life and and as we're sitting around a bunch of old geezers we still love the sport we do we, we do medal. and that to me is the most important part a coach is not should not be ranked on their success by how many gold medals or world records their swimmers make it's how many of those kids continue to swim past college and in the rest of their life that is a winning coach i agree yeah. big time and would a swimming coach ever use any social kick, do you think, in part of their workouts? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I still have one of those ocean potion boards, the hard one. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah Eat, the best boards to social kick with, right? Yeah. yeah exactly. Colin, what was your event? You, you set records in every event, every race, every distance. But you know what? When you got in blocks, this is the one that, that you own it. This was the this one you enjoyed the most. What was that one event? That, this is mine. Tuner backstroke, long course. But cool. it, interestingly, all those, I, I mean, Leah Oberstar annihilated some records. She had the national record. I think I got third at the U.S. Open one year with a 213 long course. So wow. That, that was pretty cool. And I and when I started back, when I got sober, I was at a 230 long course, 200 meter backstroke. And within two years, I was down to trials at 217.9. Didn't ever get to go to trials, but I made it at senior nationals. So, um, but I would say that where my record still stands surprisingly is 200 butterfly. Thank you, Mike. And uh, two and 400, 800 free. You know, it's wow. like, because Mike always told us, you're not a freestyler. You have to be a, a stroke, right? Mm -hmm. So you never said I'm a freestyler. You said I'm a backstroke or a medley or whatever. But uh, I'd say right now my go-to is still fly. I like fly. Fly it is. I'm with you there. Yes. Woo! All right, Carolyn. Well, thank you very much. This was, I mean, amazing conversation. You're such an inspirational athlete. Where could people find more information about you, follow you, and connect with you moving forward? Uh, CarlinPipes.com. And uh, right now I've got a book out called The Do-Over. So if you want more about the story, this is available on Amazon. And, uh, it, you know, it's basically tells all. And um, I'm also working on a downloadable freestyle DVD. So that's, gonna, that's in the works right now to really simplify it. And that should be kind of out by about the beginning of next year, just to kind of keep it simple. And, you know, just, you know, gosh, I think if I was to give anybody advice, be a seeker, um, hold on loosely. And, uh, and when, when you find something that works and you feel like you're doing less, stick with it. 
And don't be afraid to test other theories and then go with what works for you. You know, th so I'm going to jeopardize this quickly, John. There's one question here I think is really important. And, and just the last thing based on what you said. So Ronald Hen just said, uh, Colin, did you get any negative response when you first came out about your sobriety? Not at all. Not at all. Um, actually, it was all really positive. I had actually remained anonymous. And in AA, there's a thing that you remain anonymous at the level of press, radio, and television. And uh, what was interesting is the first person to break my anonymity in a public forum was Phil Witten, oh. uh, editor yeah. of Swimming World and a very yeah. dear friend of mine, because he just completely forgot about the fact that I was recovering and he mentioned it in an article. Um, and then uh, a guy named Hodding Carter wrote a book called Off the Deep End. Mm. And I met Hodding when he was on his pursuit to make the Olympic trials and then the Olympic team when he was in his 40s. And I helped him with a stroke technique. And then he dumped my story. And it was kind of like that was like early little kind of creeps out. But I always stayed very, very superficial. But I always would put the AA plugs in, such as, uh, well, why did you change your life? I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. That's all these AA sayings, right? So mm -hmm. um, no, I think most people, when they come out, the sobriety, it's like this massive monkey that you've been carrying around it is off your back and you're free to be who you are because you're only as sick as your secrets. There you go. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you sharing all that with us, enjoying us and, and all the audience members out there. Thank you for, for okay. tuning in today. Another episode of Social Kick. If you guys did enjoy this, make sure you guys put some comments in here as well as subscribe and rate us on everywhere that you do listen to podcasts moving forward. But thanks again, everyone. Everyone be safe. Have a good night and we'll see you next time. Come see me in Kona. There you go. Go see her in Kona. Thanks.